anyways, uh, it's Augustine. The uh, time was going to be, are we free? But as I started putting the material together, I realized I'm not going to get it today. I think I can get to it next week. But uh, last week, of course, raised a lot of very interesting foundational questions of existence, um, which I think I've mentioned at the time and have thought about ever since probably well the rest of my life. You know, the, the mainstream traditional churches just don't even deal with this stuff. It's just such rote. It's like, and it is. It's fairy tale and just such simplicity. They don't even delve into the most interesting things of their own um, uh, theology. So at any rate, um, we always do get the question, how can atheists have a church? Of course, the, the easy answer is just watch us. Uh, the more considered answer, and I suppose the considered answer is always the better answer, has to do with what religion is and what organizations centered on religion, in other words, churches, what they are. Now, atheism, of course, to be sure, is not a religion any more than absent of any belief is a religion. I mean, you wouldn't say that the Christians lack of belief in uh, reincarnation is, makes them a religion. Uh, but to say, how can atheists have religion since they don't believe in God? That's like saying, how can Christians have religion since they don't believe in Hindu Dharma uh, or that they don't believe in the Australian Aboriginal dream time? There's a whole other very interesting thing, the uh, Australian Aboriginal concept of the dream time. Believers, I'll do this, though. They don't just say that theirs is the one true religion. They say that other religions aren't even really religions. Uh, if you're not aware of this, the uh, Christians often say this of Muslims, and I shouldn't say Christians generally, but the anti-Muslim uh, Christians. Uh, or they say that there's so much more than mere religion. And in fact, even uh, there are Muslim imams and stuff that say that. Well, Islam isn't a religion, so they play right into what the Christians use them of. But then they go on to say that it's, it's a whole way of life and it's uh, so much more important than religion. So different people mean different things and for different reasons too, good reasons and bad. And uh, there's a lot to this as well. I think we all uh, know atheists who, and uh, maybe sometimes we ourselves use religion in a pejorative sense because we're referring to those worst hating uh, flying planes into skyscrapers uh, type religious people. Um, but the truth is that even scholars do not agree on a definition of religion. Uh, there's been many definitions offered and many continue to be offered. So the point is that these ideas are very much contested. It may well be a much more important contest of uh, what religion and church is than that of whether, whether God exists. I think we pay too much attention to the latter and not as much to the really foundational question of what religion is. And the outcome of that contest, I think, is going to determine whether rank nonsense and alternative biology, alternative history, geology, alternative anthropology, um, not to mention all the dysfunctional social and political ways of thinking and behaving, whether those will continue to be tolerated as normal because they do have their, uh, their origin in the traditional religions. Remember, even this whole idea of race about which there's so much consternation now, violence and uh, anger and, and misery. That comes straight out of the Old Testament. It comes straight out of the curse of Ham and the use to which such disgusting ideas were put and the legacy of which we continue to suffer today. Perhaps the best definition of religion comes out of that 1965 U.S. Supreme Court decision on Seeger that I know I mentioned before. A unanimous court, remember, it was unanimous one of them concurred and the other ones wrote the decisions of the nine total justices. They ruled that religion is, for legal purposes, uh, to be understood as a sincere and meaningful belief occupying in the life of its possessor a place parallel to that filled by the God of traditional religion such as Christianity. How about that? Do your beliefs, your opinions and ideas about religious questions occupy in your life a place parallel to that held by the doctrines and dogmas of all those things commonly called religion? Or does your thing even occupy a place of importance that is not just parallel to these absurd, contradictory, and unquestioned and unexamined faith beliefs? It seems to me that the ideas about religion held by many atheists are actually above and beyond those of believers, precisely because the atheists do take these faith beliefs seriously more seriously even than those who claim to profess them. 
you take those ideas seriously enough to question and examine them, and of course, the faith beliefs are found badly wanting, as we know. We all say that we're more interested in focusing on doing the positive and not just complaining about what we object to, of course, and we'll continue to do that, but it's hard. Really, it's impossible to ignore these problems and they come from, which in so many cases are the traditional uh, religion. And, and why wouldn't they? And we can't, you know, it's not just a matter of blaming on it. People invented these religions, so it, it's the people in the times that they lived in, of course. It is better to light a candle than curse the darkness, but one must first, after all, realize the need to do so. One must recognize the type of darkness and, and how to light that candle. So here is our candle in the dark. For we freethinkers realize that we don't need religion to tell us how the universe is arranged and something about how it got to be the way it is and so on and so forth. Science has displaced all these things that religion was once needed for and was in part originally constructed to do. What is left are questions that science cannot answer because they don't involve evidence that we can all agree on. They're comparable and we can talk about it and we should talk about it. That religion is about of our everyday experiences are like this. Science can inform us about that part of the human condition, but it cannot tell us what it means, what it should mean, and after all, it's going to mean different things to different people and even at different and under different circumstances in our lives. And as the 20th century philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein put it, the solution of the riddle of life in space and time lies outside space and time. The outside is italicized. I don't know if you can tell that, but that would, that's in the original. And Wittgenstein is not talking about outside of space and time in some other location in or outside of the multiverse, you know, kind of out there. He's talking about a place inside of ourselves, a place that is truly supernatural in that it is not part of the world outside of ours. It's what experience, the quality, you remember. The corollary is that not only is religion no longer a way to unend objective reality, but there are no dogmas or doctrines about any kind of world out there outside of our subjective experience that can be the basis of any sort of legitimate religious creed. This is where religion needs to have any kind of relevance or value to us as unbelievers and freethinkers. So let's recall last week when we considered the brain in a vat thought experiment, if we imagine that the world of objective reality is programmed into inputs into one or more disembodied brains by a advanced supercomputer, which this is done with uh, bodies and vats like in the Matrix films, or even if this is done by a process the supercomputer simulates the operations of a brain so that there are no physical brains at all, what then? Well, we didn't even touch on the fact that for something like that to work, there would have to be both input and output. So there's three wires. I don't know which is the input and output, the color one of them at least differently. That is, the speeder would have to feed back experience of pulling one's hand away from a hot stove when the brain or the program doing the work of a brain received an input touching a hot stove. Otherwise, our experience in life would put our hand on a hot stove and be unable to withdraw it until the supercomputer told we could. Right? So it's interesting that uh, even if we're brains and vats, we can work out some details and constraints on how in the vats or some kind of similar simulation would work. Now consider that clip of the 1999 movie, The 13th Floor, uh, where a character discovers, uh, we showed that last week, a character discovers that they're uh, in a simulation and in fact, he discovers he is a simulation in which people in the real world, of course, it could just be people in a higher simulation world. We don't know, we're not told, but the people in that other world download over his simulated body. He says to another character, a woman who's entered the session from that real world or the higher simulation, whichever it is, he says to her, none of this is real. You pull the plug, I disappear. Nothing I ever say, nothing I ever do will ever matter. This is an interesting bit of dialogue. Since it's spoken by a character who is in a simulation and is himself a simulation, what the heck does he know about what's real? He has some idea or concept of it nonetheless. 
I guess he's referring, he used to think, and now can longer think because he's seen that wireframe uh, where the simulation leaves off at the edge of the edge of his world. Now in Matrix film, the first one, 1999, Morpheus, a character, asks Neo, the hero, have you ever had a dream that you were so sure was real? And I think we've all had such dreams, and most dreams, in fact, since we rarely wake up and realize that we're dreaming within the dream. So there we are right there, living in a simulation constructed by our own brain, a simulation that we call dreaming. About that, an, an interesting thought. Last week, I also drew attention to the fact that this bit of dialogue I referred to earlier, uh, let me go back to it. Uh, this bit of dialogue is very like the accusation that theists make when they accuse atheists of having nothing to live for and say that atheism is, quote, an ideology, an ideology of despair, unquote. Of course, the idea is that there's no grand cosmic drama in which one gain eternal life and happiness in some other better reality on the other side of death, on the other side of the plug being pulled, then nothing will matter. But if that idea, that nothing matters, if it does not go on forever, that is the despair they claim. Well, here's the context. Uh, uh, I put up a Wittgenstein quote earlier, remember? Here's the context. This is what came before. He says, death is not an event of life. Death is not lived through. This is the, the quote from uh, Epicurus that Elva mentioned earlier. If by eternity is understood not endless temporal duration, but timelessness, then he lives eternally who lives in the present. Our life is endless, say that our visual field is without limit. The temporal immortality of the human soul, that is to say, its eternal survivor after death, will not do for us what we always tried to make it do. Is the riddle solved by the fact that I survive forever? Is this eternal life not as enigmatic as our one? And we joke about times what it would be like to sit around on a cloud playing a harp forever. And Christopher Hitchens compares it to a party where the, the host says, you better enjoy yourself. The solution of the riddle of life in space and time lies outside space and time. The, the, the sentence I put up earlier. So there's, there's that again. And this is what faith belief in things like an afterlife is so wrong, especially when beliefs come, as the late Christopher Hitchens put it, cost of one's critical piece. But this bit of dialogue, very unlike the charge that theists make against atheist despair, because the character who says it knows that there is for sure, unlike us, he knows for sure there's a simulator playing the role of a deity in his simulated reality. He knows this simulator exists. He sees it as proof. And for all theists know, this may be how their deity does it. Maybe their deity is the higher level of reality. It's funny that they've never uh, come up with that. Maybe there'd be a splinter of Christianity that does it that way. Even their Bible doesn't cut that. It doesn't say that creation is of real stuff and not zeros and ones in a super duper computer. The supposed first coming of Jesus may have just been Jesus downloading into a human avatar. And Judgment Day may just be simply pulling the plug. Of course, the point is all of these scenarios are equally unprovable and equally unfalsifiable. So what is the point? The point is that in considering them, we nonetheless learn something about whatever we mean by what is real and what matters. The answer to the question of do we matter or does it matter is it depends on whether we make it matter. I mean, after all, it's up to us, and I think it's a good that it's up to us. So here's what we get. And it seems likely that we're never going to have any more of this. If we find at the edge of the universe some wire frames, maybe the Hubble telescope will spot them eventually where our simulation leaves off, or even if we discover evidence that the whole universe is a botched science experiment, a science project, and an immature member of a race of extraterrestrial selects, heck, you are confronted with something as monstrous as the Old Testament deity being real. It does not affect the problem of what we're really faced with, that all we have is our perceptions, and of course, the reality that our brain hallucinates 
in the, based on those cases. It doesn't change the nature of and the central difficulty that the human condition places upon us and how we make sense of these subsets of our experience, the subjective, which includes dreams, and then all those perceptions that we can share with others that we have created science to grapple with. And this reality, and this is reality, this does not remove the responsibility we have to learn how and practice as best we can to live as rational and caring human beings. So here's our principles. No dogmas or doctrines here. No, you have to accept same substance, similar substance, uh, Pontius Pilate, any nonsense like that. Reason, enjoyment, or appreciation of what we have. Not what we don't have, but work at creating what we don't have, what we'd like to have and don't have, and finally to uh, value meaning and purpose to identify, find those things in life. So we'll open it up for discussion just a bit, but I just want to remind everybody when it comes to politics, let's talk about public policy. Um, I, I don't think um, we can necessarily read minds. We shouldn't be doing that saying, oh, this person is for this and that person is for that. Um, different interpretations put on things. We should definitely talk about civil liberties and laws and court decisions. But the facts in dispute and the ideological differences, that just doesn't lead to anything productive. We should always respect each other, and we tell them, respect every single one of you, even if I don't vote your way or agree with your policy, I respect every single one of you. I take it for granted that all of us are um, motivated by goodwill and is best for the nation and our fellow citizens. Uh, so let's not have the disagreement be antagonistic. If it starts straying that way, we can correct and should do so. Try to be dispassionate and academic about it. I looked up August 16th, and to tell you the truth, I didn't find anything really interesting to talk about. Does anybody else know anything that happened on August 16th? Anybody have a birthday or anything like that? Oh, it's a really I guess nothing much day. happened on the 16th. It's a boring day, right. So I was going to put up here, nothing much happened. Somebody Lots of things was happened. speaking. Who, who said something? I said Don it was a something. boring day. Oh, a boring said day. It was a boring day. But this isn't a boring day because we all get together and get to see each other. Right. As, uh, as uh, puny as that is compared to getting together in person uh, in the midst of this pandemic. So please think about that. 